Well, good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome to Discovery Day at Home, and I hope you're having a really good time at our virtual science festival, a uh, continuation of, um, of three years of science festivals at Dr. Jenner's house, the, the home of vaccination, where Edward Jenner first pioneered vaccination against smallpox. Um, a couple of years ago, we wanted to start just I suppose sharing some science, bringing science back to to Dr. Jen's house. We think that's probably what he would have wanted. So we started hosting this this science festival. We had big plans for this year, and um, of course uh, everything's changed. Um, but we wanted to go ahead and continue with the um, continue with the the show. So we've brought everything to you online, and and it means that we're able to do some some really different events and exciting events. And so we're really delighted to be able to to welcome Dr. Sophie Ligiel this afternoon and um, to talk about her project More Than Weeds and to find out a bit more about urban plants. So. If you're watching on YouTube, please do feel free to use the live chat box to um, send us some questions, or you can tweet them at Dr. Jenner's house, send them to us on Facebook, or even email to info at edwardjenner.co.uk. Sophie will be with us for the next half an hour, so do feel free to send in your questions. Um, we'd love to, love to hear what you thought about the talk and love to hear more about what you think about um, urban plants, but um, perhaps if I can start off, Sophie, just by asking, can you tell us just a little bit more about yourself and uh, how you came to be a botanist, please? Well, I've, I mean, literally, I've been interested, you know, in, in wildlife and in the natural world since I was three, apparently, according to my parents. Um, and quite quickly, I started, you know, getting more interested in, in plants. Um, this started, you know, as, as many people with, with a couple of house plants, then trying to grow things, very easy things like, you know, tomatoes, sunflowers, things like that. Um, and quickly, I, I thought, you know, this is what I want to do in, in, as my career. I really want to be able to, you know, understand how the natural world works, um, you know, it's not, and, and understand how it interacts as well, you know, the organism together, us with the environment as well, how we interact with our environment. Um, so I went on to study um, ecology at university, so I did a BSc in ecology. And then when I wanted to do my MSc, I was interested in plants, but I was the, would you believe it, I was the only student wanting to study plants. So I had to change university for my master's um, and I did my master's on um, orchids. Um, so, you know, um, I got interested into more the um, uh, taxonomy of, of plants as well, um, the evolution of plants as well. Um, and then I moved to the UK and um, I started working for a charity conserving uh, plants. So, you know, really getting more into applied science rather than um, purely studying, you know, the naming and the evolution. Um, and I think this, you know, this kind of opened my eyes as well to um, a more community based science as well. You know, trying to, to make people understand what science is about, um, trying, you know, also to, to address some of the, um, the issues that we hear about. Um, and you know, trying to demystify some of some of the um, the scientific matters. Um, so a couple of years ago, I moved back to France and I got involved in a project which was called White Plants of My Street. And that the idea behind that project was actually to change people's perception on urban urban weeds, um, you know, and weeds in, in general. And when I came back to the UK, I thought there was a real gap, you know, in, in that sort of knowledge. So the UK has, has got, you know, the most fantastic, you know, amounts of scientists, naturalists, people, um, you know, you've got wildlife TV, you've got books and everything. But a lot of it is about the countryside rather than urban nature, you know, nature where people tend to live. Um, you know, more and more of us are going to be living in, in cities, whether it's large, large cities, you know, towns where, um, you know, urbanization is, is increasing. So I thought there is really a gap there. You know, what if we could and look at our urban flora in a different way and learn to, um, to appreciate it? So that was the idea. And I've seen you described in the past as being part of a, a generation of rebel botanists. Do you, yes. do you think that's a fair term? Well, the, the, um, the rebel botanist term came partly because of the chalking initiative. So um, for some of you who may have read it or seen it, there was an article earlier this year about the project in the Guardian newspaper. Um, and what I started doing, um, um, I didn't invent that. It was started by a French botanist uh, called Boris Perez, and he was chalking plant names, so identifying plants and chalking the name on the street, on the pavement, um, as a kind of a fun way, you know, to educate people about plants and also to make people notice them. You know, you see something on a pavement, you're more likely 
to take notice and want to know, you know, what that plant is or think, oh, you know, this is an interesting name. Um, and so I started doing this in London. But what I discovered is that this is illegal in, in, in the UK. You can't Draw, you know, draw, um, draw on the pavements, um, and there, there have actually there, there have been some cases, you know, of children prosecuted and get getting fines because they had been drawing flowers on the pavement. So, I think you know the idea of the rebel botanist came because I started doing this. Um, I had the authorization to do it in a London borough, uh, but other people have been, you know, trying to emulate what I've been doing in other parts of the country in in an illegal way somehow. I think it's also quite fun, you know, to um, even, you know, if you don't chalk the plant names, um, but we are seen as, as, you know, not traditional botanists. We don't go to, you know, a national park, a countryside reserve to, to look for plants. It's just looking for really, you know, plants growing in walls, in gutters, you know, in, in, in kind of grotty places. Um, and the idea is, is, you know, to make people realize and understand that, well, plants are all around us, you know, whether it's in a tree pit or on a wall, you can have plant, plant life around you. And, and it, yeah, and obviously, um, I stress again that it is, it's illegal to, to chalk plant names in the UK. And um, I was quite surprised to find that out. But obviously, um, Dr. Jenner's house, we, we, have to, uh, we have to respect that. But, but do you find it, it, it has helped? I mean, uh, yeah, I'm conscious you, you've had permission to do it. Is that something you found has helped people to, to connect? What kind of feedback have you had on that? Well, I mean, the feedback, you know, when the project was launched and the article was published, that, that got quite a lot of publicity and the feedback has been amazing. Um, so what I've, I've tried to tell people is, you know, if, if you don't want to do it illegally, which, you know, I can't, I can't be seen to be um, um, encouraging, but it's actually quite a good way of starting a discussion with your local council, you know, or your local representative. You, you tell them a little bit more. And I've actually, you know, had people email me saying, oh, I've, I've contacted my local councillor. I've, I've, you know, um, I've told them that it's, this is actually, you know, education. It's, it's free um, and it's educating people, especially children, you know, who you, you walk with them on a pavement and they, they can learn about, you know, local plants in their local environment in, in such an easy way. Um, and also chalk, you know, it washes away with, with rain. So it's really not a, a, a big issue. I think the, what the, the, the worry was, was that it would be seen as graffiti and, you know, as antisocial behavior. But actually, when you start talking to council and explaining to them, you know, what it is about, um, then they're actually, um, you know, being a lot more positive about it. Um, and the really good thing is that it started projects around the world. So I've been contacted, you know, by people in, in New Zealand, in the US, in Germany, um, who've started kind of similar projects. Um, and it's grown from, you know, local community groups to universities as well, who've been doing that with their students. Um, you know, in, in your campus, university campus, they've been doing that around the campus. So I think it's, you know, it's, it's education across all kind of all ages, really. And do you think that, I mean, I, I suppose your, your project's focus is quite a lot on the, the urban plant side of things. I mean, we're, we're in quite um, uh, a rural area here in Gloucestershire, yep. but, but we have got, obviously, we've got towns and cities, we've got Bristol, we've got Gloucester. Um, just wonder, I suppose, is there any kind of um, regional variation in the kind of plants that you might see? I mean, you talked a lot about plants being, um, you know, being transferred and moved around through, through migration, through industry, through shipping. But do you, do you still get any kind of particular regional variation in, in urban plants? Absolutely. Um, I mean, this is really interesting because you've got all the, you've got the whole scale. So some plants, for example, are present in almost every continent in the world. You know, uh, bittercress, hairy bittercress, for example, is a really good example. It's present all around the world. And then on the other hand, you've got plants, you know, which have got, um, you know, very specific ecological niche. So you, you will only find them in, you know, coastal town on a specific type of soil. Um, so, you know, people ask me, you know, what are the most common plants, uh, pavement plants or, you know, um, weeds that you'll find in the UK? And it's very difficult to answer that question. I mean, obviously I live in London, but I, you know, the project isn't London focused at all. I've been trying, you know, to work around the country. And I really like, you know, when people send pictures of things to identify, which, um, you know, they might be living in a, in a coastal city or um, quite high up in a, in a, in a village in, um, in Scotland. You know, everywhere you have concrete and pavements. Um, because of the way, you know, concrete and, and pavements um, is, is actually, you know, the, the particularities of it, you'll have a different range of plants. So for example, many of um, the plants that you'll find on pavements come from um, rocky places in the world. 
So, you know, I mentioned in the talk uh, Lobelia, which comes from South Africa, some mountains in South Africa, and the pavement, because it's quite warm and rocky, mimic that sort of environment. So you'll, you'll have, you know, a, a whole range of plants that grow specifically in, in those places. You might not find them in the countryside as well. So, you know, it's, it's, it's actually quite interesting, you know, seeing how plants grow in, in, um, in different cities um, across the UK. And do you think we've, we've lost some of our, our connection with, with I, I, it's interesting, you're talking about ground cell man and um, the, the kind of, you know, finding plants as, as food. And I know in that case, it was, it was as bird food. But I mean, out here, you know, we, we get, this is going to sound really parochial, but we get loads of wild garlic. And Dr. Jenner's garden is absolutely full of, of wild garlic. I've been into towns and cities and I've seen it being sold by the bag full in, in high-end greengrocers. And I'm just always shocked about that. Um, but do you think we do have that, that sort of lack of connection? I think there's certainly a lack of connection with the, with the food. Um, and I mean, you know, things like foraging are becoming extremely popular, you know, trying to reconnect people with um, their food, trying to make you know, natural cosmetics with your um, local plants, um, you know, and, and even just, you know, looking at the different scents and things like that. And it's, I mean, this has been really, really interesting to receive, you know, all emails and things during um, the lockdown because I launched a project during the lockdown because, you know, they, for example, a lot of places, whether you were in, in, you know, urban or countryside, they stopped managing because they didn't want to send the staff, you know, um, around. And so people started, you know, noticing the change in the season, for example. So, you know, I had people sending me messages saying, this is the first time I've actually noticed, you know, plant growth over different days, because I've been, you know, queuing in front of the same shop every two or three days. So I've actually noticed, you know, the change in, and taken, you know, an, an interest in, in those sort of things. So I, th I think, you know, it's, we've, we've lost the connection, obviously, through agriculture and food. You know, you go to the supermarket, you get your food, um, and, and, you know, unless you have the space to have a garden and, and grow your food, which, you know, isn't the case with the majority of people, um, then I think, yeah, we, we've definitely, you know, lost that connection with, um, with the food, but also with white plants just as, you know, features as part of our, envi of our, envi of our environment, I think. Yeah, definitely. How about changing public perception we've had a, a question come in on the the live chat on youtube um my landlady insists i remove weeds from my patio she only sees them as untidy weeds and worries they can cause damage in the wall of her house i could tell her about the benefits to wildlife but she'll probably say there are already lots of plants in the garden for wildlife any suggestions on how to change her mind and the minds of people who are not initially eco-sympathetic um, well, this is a very interesting question. As you can imagine, this is something I get a lot. Um, I talk, you know, with the project, I talk to councils, I talk to community groups, people, residents. Um, this is something that, you know, uh, comes up really regularly. Um, first, I would like to say, in terms of the damage, um, it really depends on the plant. Um, so if anything that has got a tap root, you know, a, a strong, quite a central root, can lift the pavement. So things like dandelions, um, so thistle, plants like that, um, and anything woody. So, you know, Budleya, for example, is quite a common plant in whether you're in urban areas, countryside, you know, brownfield, industrial land. Uh, Budleya uh, is a typical one that can lift the pavement. This is not going to happen overnight, so you, you shouldn't be worried about, you know, your pavement going all over the place, but it can happen. Uh, so those plants, the rest of the, you know, plants that would grow on paving, tend to be annuals. So the risk is actually very low. Um, so that's, you know, that's one thing. Um, so if you know that you haven't got any, you know, woody plants or tree seedlings, for example, then the risk is quite low. Um, in terms of the tidiness, um, unfortunately, that's something, you know, that is very difficult to change. Um, there is certainly, you know, public perception. Um, some people are really, really, you know, very tight about this has to be neat and tidy and, you know, pavement should be for paving, not for plants. Um, unfortunately, you know, there's no, there's no kind of miracle solution to, to tell people about it, uh, apart from, you know, trying to, you know, reason people and, and tell them a little bit more about, you know, the um, amazing um, impacts and, and, and the, uh, the role of some of those weeds. So, you know, I talked a little bit about insects. Um, there are also other roles like pollution removal, you know, that, that I've mentioned in, in the talk. Um, you know, as, as I said, I've, I've got no miracle solution to convince people. I think it's very much about trying to, um, it's not about, you know, oh, let every, letting everything go overgrown. 
but it's about careful management. So for example, you know, it might be possible to tell the landlady to leave the plants until they're finished flowering, for example, and then remove them, you know, once they finish flowering um, or, you know, leave them in a specific area, you know, that would look managed. Sometimes that can work as well. So if you've got paving, um, you know, you'd leave an area kind of, 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 um, of, of paving, um, you know, with some plants and some other areas which have been where it's been removed. Um, you know, some people asked when, when you have grass as well, you don't want to cut your grass, um, you want to leave it go slightly longer. Um, an option for that can be to cut path in the middle. So it looks managed, you know it's managed, it's not abandoned, but you can leave some areas, you know, it's, it's about tricking, tricking people somehow a little bit, but also, you know, trying to make them understand that it can look different. Um, and certainly, you know, my experience from the project in France is that um, once you start, you know, showing people that things can be different, that, the, you know, over a couple of years, it's not going to be overgrown, it's not going to look horrible, then, you know, over the long term, it might be possible to change people, people's minds and people's ideas. Have you had any particular successes? Are there any kind of stories you, you can recount of, of councils or, or just individuals changing their behaviour on the basis of what they've seen? I think what, what is, I mean, the most important bit to me, um, and, you know, from experience and what I've, I've read and heard about, is people have to understand why you're making changes. So the, the, um, the pictures in the, in the Garden newspapers were taken in Hackney in London, um, and that council, they've actually been inspiring other councils around the UK. So, you know, that councillor who's kind of pushed that has been talking to others. Um, and what they did is they decided to go glyphosate free. So they stopped using, you know, weed killer in a particular estate. And initially people were a bit, you know, oh, this is gonna look horrible. And over the years, actually people got, you know, more interested, the local residents actually got interested in it. They thought, you know, they, they got actually proud of being part of some sort of pilot project. And they thought, you know, okay, it looks different. It doesn't look as, you know, neat as maybe, you know, the other estate around, but we have, you know, we've got bees, we've got butterflies. So they've been trying to make engagement with, you know, doing local walks, um, you know, trying to get people to identify the plants, things like that, you know, photo competition, anything that get people's, that gets people involved with, with you know, with the project. Um, and once you get them involved, especially, you know, children, they may, they may develop a new relationship with nature as well. You know, once, once they, get, they get older, they might not just think as, you know, weeds or plants as being dirty, but are just, just being something that, you know, they've got a right to be there. And, you know, again, it can be managed, but you have to, um, to understand and, and be able to, to leave a little bit for nature. Um, so this is, you know, this is a particular example. Um, I mean, there, there are others around the country. I think things are changing slowly, but they are changing. Um, and there is, you know, a, a strong kind of resident led um, effort as well. So people have been demanding that for their, their councils, you know, to stop, you know, cutting the grass so often, stop spraying glyphosate, that sort of thing. So hopefully in, you know, in the long term, we will see um, I think better management of wildlife. Fantastic. Do you have a favorite plant? <laughs> I, I get that, uh, that asked that question very, very often. Um, it, it's impossible. I mean, I love all plants, to be honest. So it's very difficult. Um, if I had to choose, you know, a white flower, a weed, um, I think it would have to be the dandelion. Uh, I mean, this is the plant I've chosen as the logo for the project, you know, the flagship plant for the project. Um, it's actually not that common on, on pavements, um, not as common, you know, as some other plants, as the ones I've mentioned in the talk, um, but it's an amazing, you know, all-rounder plant. So the leaves are being used in spring by some caterpillars and, you know, insects. Um, then you get the flowers, you, you get, you know, the seed, seed heads as well. Um, so I think it's, you know, it's, it's, it's an easy plant as well. You know, people like dandelions. Um, unless they're in their lawns <laughs> and then they complain um, and it's also a plant that you can eat so um, where I come from we eat the dandelions <laughs> so and I think I read somewhere that is it dandelions that there's something like 140 different insects yes. eat them and yes it's just amazing um, and they also tend to, you know, you can see flowers sometimes in December, you know, around Christmas, you can, in some, you know, areas of parks, for example, you may still have dandelions flowering. So they're actually a really good, um, and early in spring, they're actually a very good nectar source for many of the insects, you know, that come out of, of the winter. So if, uh, if, 
yeah, anyone watching this wanted to to get out there and start looking for for urban plants for wild plants where would you where would you suggest the best places to start are um, I mean, I don't know. You, are you talking about, you know, identifying them or? Yeah, in terms of yeah, identifying them, are there any particular books or, or apps or, or just just looking for what kind of things do you, do you look for? Um, well, I think, I mean, you know, depending on what, what your interest is, where you live as well, you know, someone who lives in a coastal town might not have the same sort of environment as someone who lives in a very industrial, um, you know, um, inland kind of area as well. Um, so really, it depends where you live. But I would say, you know, Botany is all, I mean, very often seen as something that is quite obscure, you know, even from other scientists, you know, I've heard it from other scientists, you know, oh, botanists, they're, they're mad people, you know, we, we, we have that image. I mean, you know, it's, it's quite true. Um, and actually, I just want to say to people, you know, botany isn't, I mean, it's, it's complicated once you start, you know, if you really want to start getting into, um, you know, proper botany, looking at len hen lenses, but actually in a first approach, you know, um, plants are amazing and if you start kind of looking at them a little bit more closely uh, then you start noticing things so if you you know start with some very easy books some of them are color based so you know if you have a flower you can compare and and you know just look at the color of the flower and try to identify them um, if you don't want to go into the book route um, there are plenty of apps um, which you, you can use and they're collaborative apps so you post a picture and then other people will have a look at your picture and you know i give you an identification so that can be quite a fun way you know especially you know if you've got children or if you just want to start in a in a quite a light-hearted way you post a picture then you get an answer and then you get interested you know in plants and and then when you go out the next time you might be able to recognize that plant you know a bit better um another thing that i would you know suggest if you're on social media um if you're on twitter so if you have a twitter account um there's an amazing um a network of botanists which have founded something called Wildflower Hour. Um, and if you post your, a picture of your plant with a hashtag Wildflower ID, uh, within a couple of minutes, you'll have an answer to what your plant is. Um, so, you know, we, we are friendly people. <laughs> That's what I want to say. Um, you know, we're just trying to make plants more appreciated. Um, you know, whether you live in, as I said, whether you live in the countryside or, or in a more urban environment um, and trying to get more people to, um, to know them. It's it's amazing how yeah how how the technology has come on that, that now you can you can do that. I'm um, thinking about um, perhaps the the history a little bit. Um, one of the questions we've had coming in is that you mentioned in um, your talk about streets having um, names, historical names associated with flowers. Do you, can can you tell us a little bit more about that, please? Um, well, it's, it's something I came across, you know, when I was working with the French project. And um, there, there are streets um, in Paris. I haven't looked at examples in, you know, other cities in the UK, actually, but I, I want to do a bit of research about that, actually. You know, it'd be interesting to, um, to have, have a think about that. Um, but for example, you've got streets in, in Paris, which is called Nettle Street. And when you look at the street now, you know, there's no nettles at all. But apparently, um, from what I've read, it was a street, you know, nettles like nitrogen. So in areas, for example, you have a lot of um, urine, you know, or fertilizer, you'll find a lot of nettles. And apparently that street used to be used kind of as a dump. So there was a lot of, you know, fertilizer um, and the nettles were amazing. Apparently there were some of the most amazing nettles in Paris. Um, and that name, you know, obviously the nettles are long gone, but that name, you know, stayed and now it's called Rue des Orties, so Nettle Street. So <laughs> um, I'm, I'm sure, you know, there are other examples um, around, around the world. Um, I mean, there's, you know, at the moment, I w there's a trend that we see in, um, in London and probably in other cities in, in the UK, where developers are naming, you know, estates and, and new housing with plant names, um, you know, that, but so often it's, it's plants that have been destroyed, you know, as part of the development. So I think it's quite sad. But <laughs> How about, um... So I'm just, I'm just really interested now in the 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 you know Nestle Street and the nitrogen and um, yeah. uh, what else you know if you saw are there any other particular plants that if you saw you could say you know that this place obviously was you know somewhere that was once a dump or or was once a building site or anything like that. Um, yeah, definitely. You know, I mentioned in the talk quite briefly about the the history and and how the plants can tell you a little bit more about the history of the sites. And, you know, certainly even now, you know, maybe 100 years later, 
um, some plants actually haven't spread in, in a very efficient way. You know, we all think about new non-native plants arriving in the UK or, you know, somewhere becoming invasive, but actually many of the plants that have arrived here have stayed in a very limited, you know, distribution around the place where they initially arrived. Um, so, you know, places, some of the, some of the, um, the ports and the harbours where you had boats coming in, um, you know, with wool or grain, um, you know, plants, plants that were coming out of those, of those boats uh, by accident um, have actually established in, in very, um, you know, narrow uh, areas and they have, they've stayed that way, you know, they've never spread around, in, around the UK or they've never spread much further, uh, perhaps because, you know, they, they needed a very specific environment. Um, you know, for example, you've got plants that are present in London because you have the heat effect, you know, with the city, but you wouldn't be able to, they wouldn't be able to grow, you know, even in Surrey or in a, in a, in a, in a local county because they would get killed by the cold. Um, so, you know, th this is, this is fascinating, you know, when you look at the distribution of plants around, around the UK, it's really, really interesting. What do you think is is next for the um, the More Than Weeds project? What what are your plans to develop it? Well, <laughs> I've been looking for you know funding for the project and and trying to develop it. And I, I really want it to be UK focused and not specifically you know London. I think um, you know plants deserve attention wherever wherever you are. Um, and I mean the proof is you know I've I've been giving interviews and things in in around the world, New Zealand, Israel, um, you know the US. So they're really, that project is really catching people's attention um, and I want to capitalize on that. So I've been looking at, um, you know, things like uh, working with councils. So advising councils on how to, you know, manage their plants in, in a better way, um, using examples, you know, from what's been done in, in other countries like France, um, where they've really managed to, you know, change people's perception um, and to change people's perception, you need the council behind as well. You know, it's not only about re local residents, but the councils need to be, you know, on it and understand why it needs to be done. And I mean, it, you know, it all contributes to their local targets and getting more nature in cities. So I think it's, um, I think this is one of my, you know, elements. And I really want to continue also, you know, more community initiatives and teaching people about plants. So I had a whole range of, you know, activities planned uh, for this year, <laughs> which obviously all had to be cancelled. So I think where the project is going to go in the next few months also depends on, you know, how the um, COVID-19, you know, evolves. But I think it's really good to be able to give online talks as well, you know, catching more people and more people's attention. And then um, I'm very happy, you know, to take questions by email and, and um, advise people as well. And yeah, and as you mentioned, I mean, uh, I suppose we're, we're all to some extent on hold slightly at the moment but mm. but as you mentioned lockdown has been a really great way of of getting people more aware of of their surroundings even if it's just doing the same walk day in day out and seeing yeah. the change in the seasons yeah i mean you know we've seen we've all seen articles about you know nature people noticing bird songs for the first time um and you know literally it's been the same thing with plants you know people have started either because they they weren't moving as much you know so they had actually time to you know, look at what's, what was happening and, you know, see plants evolving with the spring and summer. Um, and also people just, you know, notice things, notice things for the first time because they didn't have to rush so much. You know, you don't have to rush on your commute in the morning. Um, and, and so you just, you just have a bit more time to look at your surroundings and, and appreciate plants and, you know, other wildlife around you. Um, so sadly, you know, although the lockdown has been a difficult period, um, I think it's it's developed a slightly different relationship with nature, and although you know we might go back to our own ways and commuting and and you know being in a hurry, I think it's definitely definitely changed you know things in some people, and I really hope you know that we are going to capitalize on that and use what we've learned from you know from the lockdown period to um, yeah to continue with a different relationship with nature. Well, that seems that seems a very positive way to to end this we've reached the end of our, our half an hour so um uh, just to say really i mean a huge thank you to to you and thank you to everyone who's who sent in questions sophie if, if anyone else has any questions for you how do they get in touch with you um well they can get in touch via the website of the project which is more than uk um if there are on twitter they can also contact me at more than weird um, so that's quite easy. Um, and I'm, I'm also really happy if you go on my website, there's uh, my email address. So um, I'm very happy to, you know, take questions 
um, requests for advice, plant identification, anything by um, by email. I'd be very happy to um, to reply. Wonderful. Discovery Day continues for the rest of today until five o'clock. Coming up next, we've got uh, a living autopsy with Dr. Susie Lishman. So complete change from botany to, uh, to autopsy. Um, we've got all sorts going on with uh, the Dr. Jen's House Discovery Day. But um, to say once again, thank you very much, Dr. Sophie Ligiel. Thank you for your time. Mm -hmm.